Today in Conroe on IR Lone Star Radio. Uh, today we have Lois Gibson to interview. Lois is re- recorded in the Guinness Book of World Records, world's most successful forensic artist. Surviving a near death attack at the hands of a murderous felon motivated Lois to create the forensic artist job at Houston Police Department, where she's helped bring over 1,200 criminals. She wrote the book Faces of Evil, a gripping true crime book detailing most fascinating cases that she's worked. She also constructed the first textbook teaching her profession to other artists how forensic art essentials. She teaches forensic art to students from all over the world at Northwestern University, graduate of, U- graduate of UT in the FBI Forensic Artists course. Gibson used her experience to identify the sailor kissing the nurse in the famous World War II photo. Lois has been an accomplished portrait artist for 44 years. She was an artist chosen to paint Houston's mayor, Robert Lanier, and the president of the American Airlines, among other notable subjects. Currently appears on exciting segments such as True TV, Forensic Files, and The First 48. She's been profiled on ABC's 2020, Dateline NBC, People Magazine, CPS Early Show, CNN, Larry King Show, Good Morning America, Fox News, and been in Oprah Magazine, Unsolved Mysteries, CNN's Paula Zanes Now, and Discovery Channel, and many more. So, Lois, thank you so much for coming out today, having the time to speak to us. Oh, it is so good to be here in beautiful downtown Conroe. So, obviously, uh, we want to talk about uh, different uh, forensics and different crime scene law enforcement issues on this channel and just things that are facing law enforcement community by subject matter experts. And I could not think of someone that's more of an expert in forensic art than yourself. Uh, You've been doing it many years. I've been doing it 37 years. And so now I'm the oldest person doing it in the, the world. But there's nobody doing this. There's almost nobody doing forensic art. And forensic art, for people that don't know, mostly what we do is we get a witness that's seen something happen. The bad guy gets away, and the detective has nothing else but a witness that saw a face. We get with the witness, and we try to get them to remember the face they saw, the face that represents terror, horribleness to them, the person, the face of the person that stabbed, shot, or raped them. Anyway, and they don't want to remember that, so you have to do a really good sales job, and you have to draw really good and really fast. So we draw a picture from their memory, give it to the detective, and the hope is that this likeness will be so good, it'll lead the detective to find the criminal that you just did the picture of. Well, nobody thinks I can do this. No one. The Houston Police Department, 37 years ago when I approached them, They just wanted to kick me out of the building. But I do this so good, I have helped bring in more than 1,266 of some of the worst felons to walk the face of the earth. And I did write a textbook, Forensic Art Essentials, telling you how you can get with somebody and make them remember the guy they saw do the bad thing. So, uh, and you bring up a great point is, you know, you're not just an artist. I mean, when you're doing these interviews, you take on the role of areas of law enforcement, the a homicide shrink. detectives, you're, you're the counselor, a psychologist, the, the advocate, you are uh, an interviewer. I mean, you're taking on all these roles uh, to get the details. I mean, no different than any other uh, police officer trying to get what they need for the crime. Well, it is real different now. Police officers do a hard edge. They do what's called interrogation. But no, a forensic artist interviews. And to do, get somebody to remember that horrible face, you have to make them very relaxed you have to be very nurturant, and you have to be just as wonderful as you can be, considering what the witness has been through. And actually, if it's not too horrible, and if not, if they're not in a hospital in horrific pain, the holy grail of a great interview for a forensic artist is to get the witness to laugh, and that makes them access their brain more readily. It exercises their brain if they get into great laughter. But no, a forensic artist has to be just a wonderful grief counselor and sure. has to handle people that are in trauma in a deep, relaxing way. A forensic artist does her sketch alone or his sketch. You get along with the witness and you relax them and you have to draw really fast. I did portraits on the Riverwalk in San Antonio. After I got my degree from UT Austin, I went to San Antonio. And by the way, I went to dental school there too, which helps with the skull reconstructions, but that's not why I went there. I mean, I sat there and I'm going in San Antonio, why am I in dental school? And I dropped out. But 
more importantly, I was on the river walk and I did realistic portraits of tourists as they, they would sit down for a one-time sitting for an immediate fee and people would line up because I was really good and they were anatomically correct. They looked really like fine art portraits. So that experience left me capable of drawing like a fish swims in water. I draw portraits. I did about 3,000 portraits during that time. And then I moved to Houston and I saw the news. And I couldn't believe it was like a bloodbath. I'm from Kansas. I'm in Houston looking at the news. A little they bit had, different crime stats here, yeah. <laughs> from Kansas? I <laughs> yeah. mean, there's just two rabbits, a cow, and some people. So here, there were like 12 murders in one night. And I watched the news. And they would say, five foot 10, brown hair, brown eyes. And I'd scream at the TV, that's half the town. That's everybody. How's that helping? And then one day, it just hit me. I was with my girlfriend. And they were talking about a dance instructor being raped in front of her little 11 year old students. And I was so shocked to this day. It's shocking some man would rape a dance instructor in front of the bitty little girl students. And I ran toward my girlfriend's TV and I was gonna turn it off and then it hit me in one second. Wow, Diane, I could draw a picture of that guy. I draw pictures of faces and I could just talk to people. And instead of saying 510, brown hair, brown eyes. I could do the end of the nose, the hair, how is it done? And so she goes, well, just call the cops. I go, no, I have, I have to practice. So no, you tested this theory out. I, see, I tested it. I, I made it a real hard test. I didn't have my easel and I didn't really have good gear and I sent Diane to the gas station to look at the gas guy. This is when they put gas in your car for you right. if you're really, really old. And Dan, you're old, you know, they yes, put the I, gas... I, I do remember them putting gas in the, the gas pulled in the up, they took care of it. That's right. It was full service. It would cost a couple cents more, but it was full great. service. Put it in the car, really old person like you and me. So I went there, she went there, and I stayed at home and took care of her baby. She looked at him, I couldn't see him, she came back, I tried to draw it, it was impossible, I tried to quit, I said I can't do it, but she was kind of violent, she was a Leo, and she hovered over me, she didn't hit me, but she goes, keep working. And I got to a certain point, and she goes, that looks just like him. And I said, don't tell me it looks like him if it doesn't, because I started crying because the whole reason I wanted to do it is someone tried to kill me right. for fun when I was 21. But anyway, we rushed to the gas station. The guy came out of the little building and it looked just like him. And I dropped the drawing on the greasy concrete and I started crying at the gas pump because right then I knew my future. I knew if it was just looked just like him. And if I could do that, I knew I was going to catch a murder, a murder. And if I caught one murderer, I knew they were going to use me again and again and again. And I realized if I lived a normal life, I'd catch over 100 murderers. And then I started laughing like a mad scientist. And it scared the gas guy because he didn't know what I was pump. Right. I wasn't pumping gas. I was laughing and crying at the pump. And you and a picture of him. <laughs> and, and he backs away, and my girlfriend has a picture of him. She got backed away because I was scaring her. I was scaring the gas guy. They both back up, and he looks over, and he's really shocked because my girlfriend has a picture of him. And he goes, you are so good. You're just the best artist. I made him cuter than he was. And she goes, right. no, I can't draw anything. She did it. And he points at me. He goes, you did it. And I'm crying, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he goes, but you weren't here. And I go, isn't that great? I could draw you, and I couldn't even see you. All I had to do was talk to someone. And he goes, why would you want to do that? And we just left because it didn't make sense right. to the gas guy. So now, have you always been an artist? Or even as a child, you were, you were into art? Or? I drew before I could walk. I would crawl around and find other people's kids' crayons in the corner, and I would just use them all up to little nubs. And when I was in kindergarten, the first painting I did it was kind of a violent scene. The kindergarten teacher rushed up at me when I finished the painting. I was at the easel, and she grabbed my wrist and drug me away from the easel, and it was horrible in a way. And then she called the museum in Kansas City, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Fine Arts, and the museum woman came out and matted it and framed it, and they took it to the museum. So I guess <laughs> it was Early on, you were, you were making the impact. <laughs> it was pretty good, I guess. So now you've drawn many of these, and, and you felt on that day that, that you were able to solve a crime for the police. But obviously, uh, they're not as welcoming uh, as you possibly would think with just uh, wanting 
with open arms to have you help them solve some cases. Oh, you're like, doing comedy. That's so <laughs> sweet. You knew you were doing comedy. You knew you were. Okay. Their resistance to using me was fierce because for not good reasons, because it was different. I was a girl. I wasn't a cop. It was new. They hadn't done it before. All these bureaucratic reasons sure. to not change. And I had a class at UT Arlington. I've been to six different colleges. And this guy had a class just about bureaucracies. And you must understand if a bureaucracy rejects you or if you have trouble, do not take it personally or you'll go insane. I mean, this guy told me this in college. He goes, you'll go insane. Or otherwise, I would have started screaming and yelling because when I approached them, all I wanted to do was help them solve crimes. Sure. And they it couldn't. It seemed logical to you, right? You yeah. have a tool to help them. One person, it made sense. One person, an early adherent to me, he came to my side. Bobby Frank Adams, homicide captain at Houston Police Department for 17 years. And he saw me. He goes, you're a damn genius. So he thought, he thought I was a genius. But because I could draw, the third sketch I did for homicide solve the case and every third sketch after that would solve the case but they were so obstructionistic toward using me that they would only use me when they were desperate and it took them that that big large bureaucracy seven and a quarter years to give me a full-time job so and when you say that only when they were desperate so obviously you're getting in late too i mean you're not getting a witness you know probably immediately sometimes there's, there's, there's a, probably a delay if they're waiting to for you for the last minute. how smart are you do work homicides to know that exactly i cover that in my textbook forensic guard essentials sometimes detectives follow promising leads for hours days weeks and even months before they finally call you in and right. i would like to have them right away but just i take what i get and do the best i can when when i get it because i can't control God knows I can't control detectives, least of all homicide detectives. So, right, I would get them much later. But I've done a sketch six years later from a girl who was seven when she was assaulted, and it immediately identified the man. So I, it's possible. So now you, you briefly touched on a, a horrible incident that affected you, that you were violently attacked and nearly murdered by your assailant. And, you know, with that... Uh, it's given you another tool in dealing with witnesses and uh, empathizing with them and being in their shoes and, and those things and, and allows you to make that connection. Perfect understanding on your part. Exactly. You're exactly right. Like a plumber might have a, a channel lock, a wrench, a tool, a shovel. I have the fact that I almost got killed. It took 25 minutes, but I didn't die because all of my witnesses feel like they almost got killed, even if it's just a gun to the head for sure. a second. You know how that is. They don't pull the trigger. But for those few seconds, if a gun is at your head, you ponder your whole life flashes before right. or whatever. And they come in, and one of the first things I tell them is, gee, somebody tried to kill me for fun when I was 21. And you could literally see the muscles in their face relax and the muscles in their, their whole body just goes a lot limper, and they get happy. They're not happy that I was almost killed, and one girl actually yelled out, I'm so glad you were attacked, too. And then she goes, right. I'm sorry. I go, I understand. It's okay, because it puts me on an immediate footing. I'm right there with them. You know, but the other thing it does, by all means, and it's something that I'm sure you face throughout your years of doing this, there's a, uh, uh, a benefit to you in, in catching people, but you have to relive this every time you interview someone. Oh, I love it. It's therapy. Every you know. time I help get one of these guys, that's the whole purpose. That's the whole reason I put up with it. It's a horrible, it's the hardest job on the planet, but it's the most fulfilling. I mean, to have to look at a four-year-old that's seen his parents slashed to death. I did a sketch from a four-year-old that got the guy caught. He turned four the day his parents were slashed to death. And the therapy of them calling me and saying, we got him from the sketch, from my hand, my calloused hand, I produced that. I'm getting back at that guy that tried to kill me and his type of guys. And I didn't realize that it would be so therapeutic. But it's really too hard to put up with unless you have that goal like I have of wanting to catch the guy more than anything else. Sure. So with, uh, and as you said, it, you weren't 
initially accepted. You now were making sketches that led to arrest. Uh, and still, uh, they weren't offering you a job. Uh, they still didn't call you as much. And, and it's obvious it's a passion of yours. Obviously, uh, you know, one of the stories you tell in, in your book is you going back home uh, to Kansas. And uh, even there, seeing the same issue, the same problem of, of wanting to help, and even they rejected your services even after you had been doing this for Houston Police Department. Oh, yeah. I've solved uh, two serial killers. Let's see, three. I've helped bring in three serial, serial killers in Kansas. I have folks that live there, and, like, I made a proposition to their law enforcement. If for the price of a flight, I'll work your crime. I got a place to stay and people to pick me up at the airport and feed me. And when I did that to Wichita PD, they were even cheap. They go, hey, if we have a murder, can we throw in some rapes while you're here? I'm going, yeah, I expected it. And then this one particular time when they said that, Wichita PD got hit by the worst serial rapist killed. They ended up killing people, burning. These killers ended up burning two people alive in the trunk of a car. So they were really bad players. Back up to when I approached them before they hit. I approached them in June because I was visiting Daddy on Father's Day. And then July was when these two, Scott Hain and Wayne Lambert, started raping girls in Wichita, Kansas in 87. And they were doing one a week, and they were beating the girls almost to death while they were raping, and they cut one girl and pulled her intestines out of her body. I mean, they were horrible. They were mutilating. And so years later, they did a TV show about that case. And it was like 25 years later. And one of the old detectives said, yeah, we thought you were in on it. Thought you were in on it. They thought I was in on these two. But I didn't know Scott Hain and Wade Lambert. But I approached them in June. It was my daddy's father's day. How they ever feel that was some connection? They ever explained that? Because in July, the next month, these two guys hit. It was just serendipity or... They don't understand that Heavenly Father gives me timing. Heavenly right. Father has guided me. I pray, and I get placed in certain places just at the right time, and it's happened many, many times, so I can't deny his hand. But they didn't think Heavenly Father. They thought everybody's evil like you homicide guys do. Right. Right. And since it was June was Father's Day, then July, Scott Hain and Wayne Lambert, look it up, they hit started raping girls in Wichita, Kansas. So I had approached them in June. July, these guys hit. So at the beginning, they thought, well, is this woman in on it? Because she's going to get to fly up and see. Right, like a free trip to home, right? You're willing <laughs> to, to Kansas. Yeah. They didn't live. It wasn't Vegas. Right. It wasn't New York. It was Salina. I mean, it was Wichita, Kansas. But anyway, that, that sketch, they put it out, and the two guys, the two bad players, left town, went to the Tulsa area, took two people, don't know what they did to them, put them in a trunk of a car and burned them alive. So a traveling salesman from Wichita was down in Tulsa, got a free newspaper at the McDonald's, and he had a picture of my sketches in his pocket, $13,000 reward at the time. And he saw the newspaper article about these guys. They caught him for those, the double murder. And he goes, that's the same guys that were raping our girls in Wichita. So they were able to connect it. They were able to have the Wichita girl rape victims come down to Tulsa and testify because Tulsa's witnesses were all murdered and burned to death. So it helped get them the death sentence, even though one of the guys was 17 when the murders took place. So now, when you first started this, I mean, you didn't know what you were doing was forensic art, right? I mean, you, right. you had no training in this. Right. You just you knew how to do art. You were a great artist, and you knew you could help. Right? I wanted to just get with people. So, I knew I could remember the guy that tried to kill me, and, and I wanted to get that picture from their mind and give it to the detective. I love detectives. So your challenge was you wanted to receive forensic art training, but that was another hurdle for you. Oh. Yes. <laughs> then so. I found out about the FBI Academy, right. and and I was the only one that went there that didn't have a job. And I had to talk them into it. I had a little speech I gave to the head of the FBI Academy, and I go, I got a hold of him, I go, Houston needs help. And at that time, we had over 300 murders a year. So, or maybe 400, but anyway, he knew we had, it was the murder capital country or whatever. So I got to go and I was five times faster than anybody there and better. And they, they would all turn around and go, you don't have a job. Right. So that's where you found this book, right? The forensic art book for the FBI. It has all the. The catalog. The, the catalog. You're talking about, this is the tool. Right. 
If you're going to do this, everybody out there, I'm going to tell you, if you know somebody that can draw, I'm going to tell you in 60 seconds how you do it. You get a feature catalog. You give that to the witness. It's got like about 200 eyes, lips, noses, et cetera. They pick out the picture. You get two books. They pick out the nose that they think looks like or the feature that looks like their, their attacker. Then you have your own book. You look up that same feature, and you draw the feature from the book that you're able to look at. So you're able to look at the eyes that the witness tells you. And all artists know that they look at pictures and draw from them. So you just have to compose the different features that the witness gives you into good proportion. In other words, if the nose ends a certain place, the lips happen about within an, uh, an inch or two below the nose. It's not five inches below the nose. Right. So you get good proportion, and then you have to be able to change anything the witness says, and then you're done. That is how you do it. And the catalog everybody in the world uses now is the Samantha Steinberg catalog. The whole world uses it. And it's uh, just go to samanthasteinberg.com and common spelling, samanthasteinberg.com. And that's what I use. And that's what the guy in Romania and Israel and France and everybody that's that takes my class, they use that catalog. So if you can draw get the feature catalog and your witness will be able to show you the different features in that catalog and you draw pictures that you can see from a catalog. So you do have to have some type of artistic talent to begin with. Oh, I mean, you got to be good. There, there you have to draw to be good. Some, some shading. There needs to be some yes. uh, definite artistic ability. Yes. If you're drawing stick people, that's probably uh, not for you unless you have to take some other courses. The people out there know who they are. They know who they are. If there's some people listening to this, that can draw really well, and they're compulsive, obsessive compulsive. They're drawing all the time. They're doodling and they're drawing pictures when they're in class or they have free time. You know who you are. And if you think you can handle traumatized witnesses and care, I mean care about who wouldn't care. I had a five-year-old girl who was sexually assaulted. Of course you're going to care. You know if you can care and you would gain great relief by being able to use your drawing to get justice for an innocent victim, you know who you are. Now, and you bring up a point that uh, something a lot of people don't tell you, even when you're at the police academy, when you're going to be in law enforcement, I am certain no one told you coming in is what you're about to be exposed to. That you're not, a normal person does not hear, does not see what you have now seen through your career. And, and by all means, uh, changes you to point, changes police officer, certainly changes what uh, you see and feel and your uh, envision of the public. Now, the end result of that is that the reason we always stay in it, right? Because it's exhilarating because right. we're taking people off, right. right? We're solving these crimes. We're removing the bad people from society. And if we have to make the sacrifice, if you call it that, by seeing what other people don't, uh, then we're okay with Exactly. That. But, Dan, you don't realize something that I know about you. I'm going to tell you right now. Like me, you're addicted. The first time I was able to bring somebody in, I couldn't stop wanting to do it. I never wanted to quit. You're addicted. Once you, once you bring someone in with just like the drawing takes about as much energy as washing a couple of dishes, okay? And when that drawing brings somebody in, you want to do it again and again. And nothing else seems as important. You can't go uh, crochet doilies or work in a factory making bumpers. You know, you just can't, Danny. You're addicted just like I am. And that's what law enforcement, that's what a good detective knows. He gets addicted. There's a quote from Hemingway. Let me see if I can remember it. There is no hunting like the hunting of man. And those who hunt armed men long enough and like it seldom care for anything else thereafter. That's you and that's me. Once you hunt armed men it, it's uh and it's a, a reality in retirement of law enforcement leaving that world mm. and entering into uh what what we refer to as, as normal society right where mm -hmm. you're not mm -hmm. part of the stories anymore you're not part of the inside information and you're supposed to go and and take on what uh, what the general public sees as retirement uh um we don't uh, see it the same, and, and there's somewhat of a disconnect when you're out of that. Well, my ace in the hole is I 
do portraits. I do fine art. I'm on my third San Antonio mayor portrait. They're giant. They're like $8,000 oil paintings. And I got grandbabies. And so I'm, I don't charge me anything to draw my grandbabies. Right. So I love doing fine art portraits. And I have portraits everywhere. And they last for 2,000 years and they enhance people's lives. But no, I don't believe that my mind will ever retire. I won't. You're right. Okay, you're right. You busted me. I will always, when I hear the news, that this antenna will go up like right. yours. And and I will think, oh, are they lying? Who did it? So, so now you, you bring up a, another great point. Now, you've been doing this for many years. 37 years. There has been... Uh, obviously, the FBI Academy teaches forensic arts. You teach forensic arts. You've taught many artists that are out there, but there's not many artists doing this. Well, there's almost nobody. We, if statistically speaking, we don't exist. Um, there's really less than, way less than like fifty people, maybe less than thirty people doing it full time. I mean, Chicago does not have a full time. Forensic artist. I've trained two artists there. They're both fabulous. But their law enforcement command staff has the decision that, no, they're not going to let them be full-time, and they jolly well should be. They should have more than two people do it, just doing forensic art full-time. And you know that, Dan. But they think they should do regular uh, law enforcement activities that thousands of other people can do, and they are not recognizing how unique the talent is. And most cities and states in this country have no full-time forensic artists. Many countries don't. Britain, England, the UK, whatever you call it, does not have a full-time forensic artist. Neither does France or Italy. I just taught a girl from France. She was from Dijon, France. She brought me some mustard and wondered if I knew about it. I'm going, <laughs> give me that bottle. But anyway, she was from Dijon, very pretty, cute clothes she had, true. But I think she's too shy. I don't know that she's going to be able to come on to their law enforcement. You, uh, you had to fight to get on the law enforcement. I, I had to. The only reason I could put up, I don't tell how bad it was with the law enforcement with HPD. Uh, they were mean and they, they lied about telling people they shouldn't use me and come out of the overtime fund. Weird. They did stuff. There were bureaucrats that did stuff to keep me from doing cases, but I kept succeeding. But the only reason I put up with it was because that guy killed me for 25 minutes. I didn't die, but I know what it feels like. So I look past the law enforcement bureaucracy and even past detectives who don't want to use me to the victim, to the survivor, the innocent survivors. I want to, I want to help them. They're right. my boss. Right. So now, and I pulled a list up uh, earlier, or actually yesterday, from the Texas, or not Texas, the IAI, which is the International Association of Identification, and that is the organization that it's uh, basically the uh, organization of crime scene investigators, and they handle the crime scene disciplines of bloodstain, forensic exactly. art, and they and certify all that stuff. fingerprint right. people, right? Right. So they have a certification for forensic arts, which you are certainly certified as a forensic artist through them. But what was uh, disturbing was how short the list is. Okay. Yes, and I'm looking at the list, and there's a couple of people on there that all they do is age progressions of children that are kidnapped, which is so valid. Sure. But your municipalities and your counties, they need witness memory sketches, right? They have pro crimes against persons like robberies and murders that in Houston, what, 20, 30,000 robberies, uh, two, through, two, 300 murders. There's witnesses that see faces. That's what they need, and they have, they have artists on this list that don't do that, and they have artists on this list that do two sketches a year, and they have one artist who will go unnamed that hates doing it and doesn't want to do yeah, it. And when we're talking about a list, we're, we're using that uh, pretty loosely because there's only 29 people on this for the whole, and, is that we'll, how many? and we'll say the world because there's three out of that that is uh, other countries. There's uh, yeah, there's like a handful. Maybe if you take Canada and Australia, there's two or three in Australia, and two or three in Canada. Now I think something that actually goes to you is that uh, the largest represented area is Texas, and so I, I would have to give uh, you credit for uh, making so many people aware of it in uh, your area, which is Texas. Uh, there's seven, which is 
still pretty short of, of what's needed in, in larger places, San Antonio, Dallas, Houston. You would think San Antonio does not have a full-time forensic artist, yeah. by the way. It, it doesn't surprise me with looking at this. but uh, So obviously you stay very busy. What would you say would be a, a proper amount? Like, I mean, fourth largest city in the nation, which is Houston, okay, you're it. Okay, what, what would be a proper amount to handle Harris County, Houston, the surrounding metropolitan area? Harris County should have one, and this area, Montgomery County, Conroe Complex, should have one too. And uh, Los Angeles should jolly well have one, and they don't. And San Diego doesn't have one. My gosh. I mean, do you see that they, yes, yeah, yes that they would... should. Here's what happens. Law enforcement, uh, for high school reasons, dumb high school reasons, they don't want artists because artists are like me. They're all touchy-feely. But they need to be because that's good. Go on, Dan. That's good for the witness. You know sure. what I'm saying? I good mean, you know, you're talking to me and you're like, gee, if my dog died, Lois would be good to talk to. So you have to be that kind of person. And I don't know. And they're not pushy enough to push in. But you know what? They're going to do a TV show. Some really strong players in L.A. and Hollywood are going to do a TV show. And if that TV show about me and my work comes out, right. uh, I'm going to use it as a pulpit uh, to, to promote other forensic artists because there's plenty of talented people. And law enforcement n needs to know something they don't know. Here it is. 100% of the time when a sketch artist sketches from a witness memory, it has the potential to solve the case because there's been sketches I've done that were really poor likenesses and they nevertheless prompted a tip. So you're going to get even crummy sketches will help. So there's plenty of trained artists. So law enforcement should always use, if you have a witness that lives through a scene that sees a face, if you're serious about investigating the case, you should get a uh, sketch artist to get with the witness and create a composite. I'm absolutely positive. A hundred percent of the time when the witness wasn't lying, if I did a sketch, at least it looks similar. An example, last April, I did one from a murder scene. A 17-year-old saw his daddy shot to death, and then the silly murderer goes through the daddy's pocket and gets the wallet and the cell phone, and he watches, and he was grieved, and I got with him, and I did a sketch. A few days later, I got an email from the detectives. That murderer saw my sketch and called and turned himself in to homicide. So, and it wasn't that good, <laughs> but I'm not going to visit the murderer and say, you know, I completely bombed on your eyebrows. I did it, not it get worked. the eyebrows. It came in. It That's worked. It. it worked. Maybe he's got conscious. I don't know, but my head was in the game. So, look, law enforcement, like in Chicago, they're wrong. They should have full-time forensic artists. I'm right. I'm positive. And now I hope I don't get home. And they have an ice pick <laughs> hole in my tires from some Chicago guys. But they really should. The law enforcement command staff should have Luis Santoyo and Timothy McPhillips, two artists who have taken my training. They're very talented. And they're on the force. So what do you think stops law enforcement? What do you think What do you think's the big... Uh, uh, I guess they don't get it. Thing. They think... I've heard them say the way they're... My, okay. They have a logical mind, yes. I, and I know how their mind works. I, I've been with them like 37 years. I've been steeped. I've been just completely surrounded. So if you use logic, you will never use a forensic artist because 100% of my witnesses, listen closely, 100% tell me in the beginning of the sketch, I don't think I can remember enough to do a drawing, or they'll say some version of that, or it'll be the Chinese accent or a baby talk, little kids, they go, we can't remember enough to do a drawing. Why are we don't know? We can't. The witness themselves believes that it's impossible to do what the artist does. But I have tricks. I describe them in my textbook, and I jolly well have helped catch over 1,266 perpetrators. And every time they have found the person, they look like the sketch. So law enforcement thinks they're going to get a faulty sketch, and they're two perfectionists. They don't believe that, wow, what about if a faulty sketch can somehow, maybe just I've had with just the eyes and the forehead, the hairline. What if a faulty sketch can nevertheless help catch, help solve the case? Law enforcement, you got to get out of your comfort zone. Call in the artist, get them along with the witness, stay out of the room, and see what you get. 
No, obviously, and, and that's just the stuff that you touched on. The brain's an amazing thing. I mean, and when you're involved in a, a violent act against you, you you're going to try to block things, right? And I mean, exactly. cer- and certainly trying to, I'm sure they truly uh, are telling you the truth. That yes. They don't, that they don't remember because yes. they don't want to remember. And that doesn't mean that it wasn't recorded, that, they're, that they don't have that image in there to, to bring out. You're exactly right. The yeah. visual cortex is way in the back of the brain. That caught that image. But the part where they're speaking, the in charge of their speech and their logic is in the front of the brain. So they're saying what they believe and also having been a victim, they're blocking it. And they don't want to think about it. Now, I'm curious. To, now, in officer-involved shootings, okay, one practice that we've normally done is uh, we wait uh, 24 hours, 48 hours for uh, there to be from what um, you know we've been taught and trained is uh, for a connection from short term to long term. Have you seen any benefit in drawing from a witness who you saw immediately after versus someone who came in uh, a little bit later after after some sleep and such? I've had everything, and I'm not going to involve myself in impossible to understand scientific stuff and have a study where I get. A thousand officers shot and see what they remember. No, I'll take whatever I can get, but as sooner is better. And uh, I don't believe you need have to wait, and you just have to be able to handle the witness with whatever. I had an officer who was shot in the head, shot in the back. Toughest guy on the force, Paul Deason. This yeah. guy is tougher, pound for pound, <laughs> pound for pound. This guy is so tough. But anyway, he stopped a guy. Going to give him a ticket. He didn't realize it was an escaped convict. The, the guy opened up and shot him in the head. Then his body twirled around. He shot him in the back. Paul's body twirled around. So he shot twice. He falls down unconscious for a moment. And Donald Eugene Dutton was the shooter. He got back in his vehicle, and on purpose, he ran over and drug Paul, Officer Deason, over 60 foot. And then... Officer Deason released his body from under the car by pushing up. Of course, he catches the muffler and burns the skin off his hand, of course. And so he's so tough, he walks back to his unit, to his radio, and calls in his own assist, and they played it during court. He sounded bored. He goes, officer down, officer shot. I thought, God, this guy. So I went to his bedside two and a half days later, did a sketch. He doesn't remember doing it with me. I got it hanging on the wall because the shooter, Donald Dutton, got caught trying to shoplift a chainsaw from Sears. Two guys at the jail, when he was brought in for shoplifting, thought he looked like the sketch. They had a video lineup in Paul's hospital room, and Paul, Paul picked him out cold. And then they went to the scene of the shoplifting and found, searched all the cars, and they found the car, and they found pieces of Paul's skin and uniform oh. hanging from the undercarriage of the car. Paul does not remember doing this sketch with me and the first thing paul said was i never saw his face i only saw the flash of the gun but i have a trick if people say they didn't see the face here's the trick you act real nice you don't argue with the witness right. he was an aries by the way anyway so paul decent officer decent the aries you don't argue and then i just said what kind of man would do this what kind of expression did he have if they answer the question of what kind of expression they saw the face. So right. I was waiting for that to happen, and I thought I was going to fail. And he I'll never forget, he said, he looked like a shark, like he didn't care about anything at all. And in my mind, I'm going, yay! And I did a sketch, and it got him caught. Now, you had wrote about that story in your book, and the other thing that I remember from that is uh, he was using that FBI book that you were having yes. to pick things out. And he was picking the first of all the uh, characteristics. Life is cruel. And uh, you thought Life that, that, that was cruel. wrong. Life is cruel. That he was just doing it out of tired, out of weakness. That's right. You have to believe in yourself. I finished the job, and I wanted to just quit and walk out, and I was doing it injured. I was injured. I thought I was going to have my leg amputated, but I went on anyway to work with Paul Deason. And... The darn luck was that this gosh darn crook that shot him has features like the first one in every category. Right. So he was picking number one in all the categories. And inside, I was falling apart. I was giving up. I wanted to just cry and grieve for knowing I was failing. But I went ahead and drew what he drew. And then my least favorite thing 
It takes forever. It is horrible. It's plaid shirts. And the last thing, I was injured. I was hurt and I was in pain. And I said, Paul, what kind of shirt? And he goes, a plaid shirt. <laughs> I'm like, gosh darn it, could this shooter not at least go and do it wearing a solid top? No. So I did the pla plaid shirt, but it, it did look like him. And Paul, I saw him at the trial. And he didn't remember me because he was all bandaged up. And I didn't remember him, but I saw the the name tag, right. and it was decent. I said, Paul decent and he goes, can I help you, ma'am? He crossed his arms like, leave me alone, and I went, Paul, I'm the artist that did the drawing, and he goes, oh, God. He goes, sit down. I want to close my eyes and listen to you talk because he liked hearing me talk. It was something he did remember. So what I wanted to do is you wrote this book, uh, a while back, it's uh, 2005. It's Four, yeah, 2004. close to Okay, so uh, some things have changed, but I'm curious what has changed. In the back, you put some myths, okay, that uh, to address. And, and one of the top ones, uh, which obviously things have changed to a point, uh, that there's no need for use of friends' cars because we've got computer software these days that are just as good. So obviously in 15 years, computer stuff has changed. Uh, is there anything out there that one assist forensic artist, uh, and certainly I would gather just by your passion for it and your, uh, put it, nothing is replacing them. Nothing is replacing. Now, some of the younger ones are doing this one thing. They draw it by hand, but there's no system where you can just do it if you can't draw. That's what they're trying to tell you so they can sell you a computer. They're right. trying to make money off computers. I've tried all the computers, and back to what gr kids do use, is they'll scan in a hairstyle that's hard to draw. Okay. But I'm so quick, I can draw where you have the bald head with just little sticks of hair coming out, but you can still see the shiny skin. I can do that really quick because I'm, like, really good. But they'll scan one in and put it on there on their face. Let me explain briefly why computers don't work because I, if they did, I would use them. Okay. I tried after five hours of training to make a computer image of Bill Clinton when he was a sitting president and I could draw great and I could draw him by hand with my left hand in my sleep and I could not make the computer make a, an image that looked like Bill Clinton. Does that explain to you that they don't sure. work? Sure. Then there's another explanation. Michael Street, who's on this list, who was the main demonstrator with John Walsh of America's Most Wanted, of the FACES computer program, which is the number one, which right. still does not work. But he toured the country showing you how you could do composites on the FACES program. So Mike Street, when he heard about Samantha Runyon in Stanford, California, getting kidnapped and killed and witnessed by the girlfriend of the little girl that got killed, Samantha Runyon's girlfriend saw her get kidnapped. Mike Street did the sketch, and he did it by hand. And this is after doing it on computer for, for demonstration purpose for 10 years. When it really mattered, he did it by hand. Does that tell you? And then it caught the guy, uh, uh, Alejandro Avila, and he got the death sentence. Okay, so he got convicted. So that tells you they don't work. See, now I remember when Faces came out. I remember they were they were given to because you know they'd give it to homicide because it was hopefully a, a solution, right? I mean, if if you didn't have that availability, but um, it, it was very obvious to us. I mean, because I can't draw. Okay, I, it's not me. My my wife's talented artist. I, I am not. Okay, so I could sit there and flip, and I think part of that, and part of being an artist, is having that vision, having that yes. eye to see. Yes. And if you don't have that, it doesn't matter if you give me the little identity kit or the flip book or the faces. Uh, it's not going to work that great for me. And it was something that I could identify very quickly. Um, now I am curious as um, as Photoshop has progressed and, and they have all the brushes, tools. Have you ever used, uh, just drawn electronically using the pastels and things built into a computer program that is still a pen type of tool? I've taken training in that over the years many times and there are people that do that. But I think if you got, gave, gave them truth serum, they'd say, no, it's not as good as somebody just drawing it by hand. And somebody that can draw by hand, which there's people out there I mean, they're out there. I, I wish they would take my class. But if you draw by hand, you can do it much better than it would take you to just boot up the computer. I mean, it's just quicker and it's better. Well, I, would, I would think there's a feel to it also. I mean, Trust just... me, I am not trying to fight computers. If they worked, I'd say, oh, yeah, I've got it in my 
house, I mean, at my office, and I use it. But you're saying drawing with a computer, it can happen. But to really do a face from a witness memory, it's an inferior product. Maybe these younger kids would use them. But there's something that you may not know about that's going to change my field, and it's I'm so glad I lived to, to see it. They now have uh, artificial intelligence where they can recognize faces. Right, right. And facial they are recognition. Facial so. recognition. And just recently, uh, different artists are entering their sketches into and getting them compared to databases. And the facial recognition is solving the case using a sketch, comparing it to known mug shots. And facial recognition has come. I mean, I will say I looked at uh, I looked at new technologies, I guess probably about five, six years. I went to the International Association Chief of Police. Facial recognition was not there yet. It was, five years ago right. it was it's it new. was it was still right. um, it was still learning. Yeah, DPS I mean, Texas, you know, that's our Department yeah. of Public Safe, Safety, Texas, the guys that give you tickets and the Texas Rangers. Uh, <laughs> right. They bought it last year. And they haven't used my one of my sketches, but there's a girl named Samantha Steinberg in Miami. She does, she's the Miami forensic artist, and she's had four hits putting her sketch in and That's facial awesome. this and that. I live to see that, aren't you? I'm so glad so, I live to see that. So now you, because I do want to touch on it before we wrap up. You don't just do forensic art in the aspect of an interview with a witness. They saw something. You've also done age progression. You've done yes. uh, reconstruction on, on a body that's been decomposed. That Very we know, we easy. We no longer know right. what they look like. But, I mean, those are other uh, things that a forensic artist does. It's Skulls. not just limited. Right. Yes, and some people think that's all there is. In fact, there's one place, only one place in the world, you can get a degree at a university, and that's in Dundee, Scotland, and it's a two-year master's, but 85% of what they teach is facial reconstruction on a skull. Well... That's hardly any, that's a tiny percentage. It's less than, I would say, 3% of a forensic artist's duties. Mostly what this world, like Chicago, needs with all their murders, they need witness memory sketches, which you understand, you know, totally, Dan. It's a different thing. But, yes, when I get a skull, the last five, immediately after, I, I do those readily. They're not hard for me. They're easy. No, I don't sculpt clay on them. If you put clay, you lose the skull. You can ask your wife. She's artistic. You can see people's skull when you're sitting there. Most of it's right there. And so I just look at a naked skull, and the family members recognize and call up. And so those are easy for me. And I also teach how to do it, and it's also in my book, Forensic Art Essentials. But that's something that, you know, you, do, you, you don't do that often, but also age progressions. Right. Now, I've done the largest age progression. Yeah, you talked about a real long one in your book there. And they were told that the International Association for Identification made a rule saying we don't age progress babies. Well, I'm sorry. I was glad to find out I broke the rule, but I did it 10 years before they made the rule. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means uh, as far as I should get punished by them. But anyway, there were one- and two-year-old babies. And the girl lived around here. She lived in Tomball. And she called FBI, and she goes, it's been 30 years. I want to get my brothers back. I don't know where they're at. And they go, call Lois, because they knew I was kind of like so far out of the box, I couldn't see the box. So she got with me, and I said, yeah. She had pictures of them one and two years old, and I made them look 31 and 32, and I knew people on America's Most, I mean, on uh, Unsolved Mysteries. That's a TV show. It was a big TV show in its time. I knew the main number, so I got her a free trip to Hollywood. They showed my age progressions, and she got her brothers back that night. She got reunited. For that type of time that's gone by to, to be able to make an image that's recognizable. and. But I can and see a baby. I can see, I can look at you and see what you would look like as a baby. I do it back and forth. Which, if you get mad at you, hate your boss, just picture him as a baby and you're good. But anyway, I do age progressions of babies, and I've always been able to see what people would look like because in the Parade magazine, they'd show pictures of famous movie stars as a baby, and I would always go, oh, and I'd instantly know who they were. And my family members would go, what are you talking about? I go, oh, that's Pat Sajak as a baby. 
But anyway, now the big payoff in my life, I'm so happy I live to see this. I have grandbabies. And I got to tell you, they're going to be really good uh, adults, good looking adults. <laughs> So as we wrap up, we have a few minutes left. I want to certainly give you the opportunity. Uh, you have uh, the one book we've talked about a couple of times during this interview, Faces of Evil. You spoke about your one as far as teaching. Um, so uh, basically just a time for you to, to plug your information of how do people get in touch with you for your classes or things you have going on. And, and, uh, and certainly if they need you uh, privately for portraits or professionally for what you do. Well, thank you, Dan. Yes, I love drawing faces. I've done now 7,000 portraits, and I did write a textbook. If you're out there and you can draw and you think you can handle it, you know if you want this work. You know if you want to do it. Uh, Forensic Art Essentials, you can get it on the Internet. It's by El Sevier. And then Faces of Evil is my true crime book. It's well written because I didn't write it. A smart writer girl wrote it, <laughs> Deanie Francis Mills. And I do have a class. I tried to retire, but I decided I'm going to go ahead and teach a class. I decided last night, March 1st through 5th in 2021. It's going to be okay. a long time from now. And you can go to, the main thing is for all of this, go to loisgibson.com. And that's how you can find everything and my contact information. And my manager is Peter Jennings' cousin. He's also my husband, and he sounds like Peter Jennings, the guy that used to do the news for ABC. Yep. He sounds like him on the phone. So if you call, it's like the Canadian accent and everything. But you can contact me, and I just hope that these younger artists, if you don't get my book, if, if I die before you take my training, I'm 69. Listen out there, you artists. This is the most fulfilling work you'll ever have. The sketches are quick. You just nurture the witnesses. You can't believe how good it'll make you feel. And they're starting to have facial identification, so they're starting to put your sketches in computers and compare them to mugshots. So if if I die before you have your success, I wish you all you artists out there all the success in the world, and I hope you start in this profession. Well, thank you so much for coming in, Lois, and I hope that you have encouraged some people to take on this profession. Thank you again so much. Oh, you're so welcome.